Today, I'm speaking to Dr. Kelly Victory. She is someone we've spoken to before, and of course, this is an update. I've known Dr. Victory for a long time. She's a board-certified ER physician with uh, decades of experience. She also is the CM CMO of Whole Health Management, delivering healthcare to Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we're going to get into it a little bit. She and I don't, don't always agree on everything, but that's what that's how it should work. That's how medicine works. That's how science works. Uh, we just have discussions about things, and the more public and the more the more we hash things out, the, the way we find the truth. That's how we find our way to the truth. Uh, today, amongst other things, we'll be talking about nanoparticles and exosomes, those sorts of things. And it's an article a bit above uh, my level of expertise, but I'm interested in finding out more. And hopefully Dr. Victory can enlighten us. And we are taking your calls over at Twitter Spaces. And of course, we're watching you at the Rumble Rant and at the Restream Chat. So we'll look for you all there. And let's get going. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? Uh, I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome everyone, we appreciate you being here. Again, we are at Twitter Spaces. If you want to uh, ask questions of Dr. Victory or myself, you just raise your hand, then I'll bring you up to the podium and you will be agreeing to stream out on multiple platforms. It includes uh, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, we're all over the place. Um, did I miss anybody? Uh, Susan Pinsky, how are you? Fine. We had a interesting, a lovely weekend in Montana with a family wedding and it was beautiful. And, and everybody lovely. came home sick. Uh, we have more COVID <laughs> in the house again. Uh, well, we I, don't know if it's in the house. We know some's in New York, though. Well, I'm assuming the one of our people. In one of the houses. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we were all exposed to the one that was that is sick. And by the way, um, she reported to me that there are already multiple reports from the wedding group. Of well, what's COVID. weird is Paulina had COVID in June mm -hmm. and she's got it again. Mm hmm. And she was, but she was kissing and, and hugging vaxxed, everybody. And she's fully vaxxed and boosted. I have this thing about weddings. <clears throat> I don't kiss the bride and the groom. You know, everybody hugs the bride and groom. I give them fist pumps because I don't want to get sick. And I got sick during my wedding because I kissed everybody. And Paulina was just up and hugging everybody and face to face with everybody because, you know, maybe she felt a little bit more immune than the usual person because <laughs> she just had COVID. And lo and behold, she got it. Yeah. But she may have also got on the plane because she got <laughs> stuck in the airport on the way over. And she was sitting there in the airport a long time and on two planes. And then she had to take another plane. In other words, she might have brought it to the wedding. But there are already multiple reports of COVID breaking out. Oh, for it, sure. It, for sure. It, you, did she tell you? I, it was the most kissy, huggy party I've ever been but to. But have you actually heard the what's happening? No, what happened? Multiple out, multiple people sick. I mean, so, I got mine on 4th of July weekend. So obviously... That's when you pick it up. Right. So when you go and, around uh, other people. So she got it for the July and then I was locked in a room with her for three days. Didn't get a thing. Yeah. So. But I mean, it wasn't that is... bad. I had a sore throat. The first day was kind of miserable because you have a sore throat and you just feel crappy. And point is, it's, you it's get better infectivity is highly unpredictable. The degree to which you are actually sick with it is difficult to predict. Uh, you know, the use of Paxlovid and fully vaccinated, relatively young people has really not been studied. So we're sort of uh, flying by the seat of our pants with well, that. Well, yeah, she took Paxlovid, so maybe she doesn't really have the immunity now. Well, that's one of, of the that. concerns. That would be that. my thing. That's but I prefer to just tough it out, get over the virus, and then hope that that's I don't That's what get she's doing again. this time. She didn't like the taste she got in her mouth from the Paxlovid. I get a, so. kind of a little runny nose from the party, so maybe I'm fighting it off. Never know. Uh, there but are... it's not that bad. It's not like, you know, I'm not going to die. So. Let's see. Other people, I'm looking at the restream. There are many, many of our our restreamers that have had COVID recently. Yeah. And let's be fair. The uh, let, Let's bring in Dr. Victory. Let, let yeah. me do that. Even if you have uh, a vaccine, I, you're going to catch it. So that's uh, it Dr. Victory has a BS from Duke, an MD from University of North Carolina. Again, she's an ER doctor with decades of experience. And Dr. Kelly has been commenting on COVID from since the beginning. She has very specific opinions about this that I admire. I don't always agree with, but I love to engage with her. <laughs> Dr. Victory, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me as always, Drew. 
So what I was uh, what I was going to build to, and I wanted to bring you in on this conversation is the you know the R naught on Alpha and Delta was three. The R naught on BA five Omicron is seventeen. So the question remains: Can we really do anything to prevent the sort of spread of this thing, other than beef up our own immunity as much as possible? As I've been saying from the very beginning, Drew, uh, and you well know, viruses mutate. All viruses mutate, and coronaviruses mm -hmm. are particularly adept at it. They do it more quickly than other viruses. And as they mutate, they do, with extraordinarily rare, really reportable exception, they do two things. Number one, they become more contagious. And number two, they mm -hmm. become less lethal. And that is precisely mm -hmm. what we are seeing with COVID-19. This virus is endemic, meaning it is here to stay. We are not going to eradicate it. We never were going to eradicate it. Just like we haven't eradicated influenza or the common cold or a myriad of other viruses. We need to learn to live with it. Um, the reality, unfortunately, because of uh, this vaccine program and the specifics of these vaccines, it is driving, unfortunately, the vaccinated to be at higher risk for contracting COVID than those who are unvaccinated. And the data are irrefutable. Now, this does not make me anti-vaccine. I'm anything but. I've spent much of my career in public health writing and speaking about the importance of vaccination. The reality is, however, these particular vaccines are highly problematic. Uh, we'd start with the fact that they are non-sterilizing, meaning they don't prevent you from contracting the virus. And as a result, they in all likelihood drive viral mutation more quickly than would otherwise occur in nature. And we're seeing everybody from you guys uh, and you know, our sitting president, if twice vaccinated, double boosted, coming down with COVID. It's simply the reality. Well, let's let, um, let, let me let me let's I want to stop and break this down piece by piece. So so now one of the concerns about the current vaccines, and there's lots of concerns and there's lots of sort of things to talk about. So so concern one is it's not against the variant that is circulating. It's against the alpha, essentially the alpha and the delta variant. Now, having said that, my understanding is that the cellular immunity caused by the vaccines that are out thus far, and I have to ask you about the different kinds of vaccines because there's more stuff coming. Um, mm -hmm. But the cellular immunity does seem to confer some benefit from the standpoint of reducing severity of illness. Do you agree with that? There, there may be. It's, it's unclear. Let's start with the first piece of it. It is absolutely a fact that the vaccines, none of them, cause you to create antibodies to the right spike protein. All of these vaccines were predicated on the original Wuhan strain of COVID, and they forced, they right. caused you to develop spike proteins and then create antibodies to them. It's a spike protein, however, that doesn't exist any longer. It is mutated out of right. existence. So if you were to get vaccinated today for COVID with any of the available vaccines or boosted with any of the available boosters, you will induce your body to create antibodies to a spike protein that doesn't exist. You will create an right. army of immunity to something that isn't out there. So pretty much useless. Right. Um, whether there's some level of cellular immunity that pro confers protection against severe illness is tough to know largely, Drew, because the current variants namely Omicron so and then the subvariants BA4, BA5, don't cause severe illness. So how the heck yeah. would you know I, if you had any protection I, I would from say, the vaccine? I, I would say, I don't know what you saw clinically, but not so much with BA4, BA5, but that BA2 point, what was it, 7.2, that, that one, I saw some unvaccinated get very sick. And I saw vaccinated sort of doing awfully well with it. So I feel like the earlier Omicron we there was something good going on from the vaccine right now i kind of agree with you i'm not sure what we're getting out of it though would you also agree that in the the elderly population the say 75 plus being bo vaccinated and boosted probably a good idea based on currently available data agree or disagree with that well, I pro if so, you know, I can't really um, suggest these current vac the vaccines based on the current. Um, you, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. I'm not going to ask you that. 
I'm, that's different. That's different. That's a different question. That should you get reboosted now? Should you have been vaccinated and boosted oh, to this okay. point if you're over 75 y years of age? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I said yeah. from the very beginning, okay. were my parents okay. living, you know, in yeah. their 90s in a nursing home early on with yeah. what we knew? Then, yeah, I would have said yeah. it's there's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk benefit calculation. So when you're talking exactly. about people over the age of 80 who are otherwise, you know, might be immunocompromised then the risk benefit yeah. calculation perhaps worked in their favor for the rest of us uh you know healthy people under the age of 50 and god only different, knows healthy people under the age of 18 yeah. the the risk benefit calculation never never made sense for that group okay i, I i'm going to get to the, those those issues because i agree with you on most of that but let, let's get to that in a second but so like for instance back to your what your original statement that i interrupted about not revaccinating right now. I totally agree with you. In fact, I've got double boosted 75 year olds coming at me now going, should I get a third booster? And I've been telling them, no, wait till if we're going to do this, let's do it in September, October when we have an Omicron booster. Let's wait till then. You're, you have plenty of cellular immunity. You don't need more antibodies against a, va a thing that's not circulating. Let's wait until we get the, the proper vaccine in place. That's been my advice. Do you agree with that? Well, the, here's my problem with it. By the time this va the new, what they call the bivalent vaccine comes out, the drug manufacturers are working currently at a new vaccine mm -hmm. that includes, for some unknown reason, still includes the Wuhan strain, but also mm -hmm. incorporates uh, mRNA. I don't know why, since it's extinct, but it also incorporates mRNA from the newer variants, namely BA4 and BA5 couple of problems. Number one, by the time they roll this thing out in September, October, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but BA4 and BA5 will be gone. It will have mutated to Probably. a different uh, version. Dif we are always fighting issue. last year's war. On top of it, this is uncharted territory, Drew. Not only is mRNA vaccination uncharted territory, but the concept of boosting and boosting and boosting in rapid succession uh, for, for something. I mean, this is we, these are uncharted waters. We don't know the long-term effects. And that for me, why right. are we continuing to do this when we have a very mild virus that's going on? I would ask you and Susan, for example, of the people who you know who quote, got sick at this wedding, if it weren't good, take yourself back in time, try to put yourself in the mindset mm -hmm. of, you know, 2019. If you'd gone to a wedding mm -hmm. and come back with these same symptoms, would you even have mentioned it? Would you even have no. uh, this this whole right? This whole COVID thing has gotten people every time they sneeze or, or sniffle. It's like it's heightened people's concern right. and awareness to an unhealthy level. Prior to this, this okay. is what we called in the olden For days sure. a cold. Yeah. We called yes, this a yes. cold back then. Okay. I'd be days. more worried about unplanned pregnancies at this wedding we went to so what <laughs> alcohol what? poisoning and then it getting covid <laughs> yeah right or or liver failure we had a couple of those oh my god uh i, I am uh looking up the name of this epidemiologist uh was it holton something like that uh hang on a second um Dr. Victor and I have a new hero he's a sc dermato uh, 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 epidemiologist who uh, got up publicly, oh shoot, what is his name? Paul Holtum, there it is. Paul Holtum gave a press conference where he said, you know, we're about to have a mask mandate in, in Southern California, Los Angeles, by a sociologist based on numbers. Our hospital is not admitting anybody with COVID. We have no one in the hospital. We have no one in the ICU. We're not even seeing respiratory symptoms. This is right. not based on anything real. And uh, then he went on to say, and this is why I bring this up, he goes, surely uh, you must be having a, a really difficult time not having something to be frightened of. So, oh, yes, let's get monkeypox. Let's, let's look for monkeypox. But they've moved right on past monkeypox, I've noticed in the last 48 hours particularly, to long COVID hysteria. Have you seen this? Yes. Now, yes. now oh, they're oh, yes. saying... Well, yeah, kids don't get sick, but they could get long COVID. And long COVID is going to cause mass disability in the state of California. I was like, oh, my God, where did this come from? This is no, insanity. And, I'll let you comment. No, and, and it's not based in fact. The, the kind of long COVID is a you know term that was made up during this pandemic. It's what you and I used to call uh, during our training and during clinical practice post-viral syndrome. 
There are many viruses, not just COVID. Epstein-Barr virus, for example, known very well for it. Uh, influenza, uh, other viruses that are well known for having protracted and sometimes very strange symptoms that can last for weeks or months following a severe infection. Uh, all of a sudden with COVID, that got termed long COVID uh, rather than just post-viral syndrome. There is zero right. evidence that someone who doesn't become significantly ill, i.e. a child, uh, somebody under the age of 30 who has a mild case of COVID and gets over it, that those people are at risk for post-viral syndrome of any sort. So again, this is craven fear-mongering that's been going on from the yes. beginning. Yes. I, I don't know if you saw that New England Journal article that was really quite good that looked at, I forget how the study was constructed, I read it a few weeks ago, but it was essentially the conclusion was, which is what impressed me, was that the probability of long symptomatology post-COVID is identical to any other diagnosis that had been hospitalized once they're out of the hospital. Of course, when you're very sick, you feel like shit for a while afterwards. Right. That's how it works. Now, now exactly. I will I will back off that and say a little bit. I had long COVID twice, and it was a very unique kind of a thing. I, I, and let and let's be fair. This is an endovascular disease. It's slightly different than your average cold. It has some features to it that are kind of wild, uh, and and whatever that long COVID thing is that we have not actually defined. To your point, we haven't really defined what it is yet. Mm -hmm. It it's something, but it it is in almost. Every case, it improves and it can be treated. Again, I I refer you guys to covidlonghaulers.com, and it doesn't cause sustained disability except in very very rare exceptions. And those people were already very very sick. Now, let me just pile on top of that. Do you want to comment on that first, Kelly, and then I'll then I'll. Well, I was going. just going to say that that I can say from my own personal experience, I had a case of uh, what we presume was influenza back when I was considerably younger. I had just finished my uh, my residency. Mm -hmm. I was very sick for a couple of weeks with a viral infection, and it lasted for the the long term effects. Uh, feeling uh, fatigued, muscle aches, exercise intolerance was so profound yeah. that I actually went about six months later, Drew, and had a stress test. And, you know, you may know I was a distance runner for the better part of my life, and I could not run. Six, eight months mm. later, I went and had a stress test because Weird. I was convinced I had some cardiac issue. And instead, it was just, quote, long you know post-viral syndrome. It yeah. went away. Yeah. Uh, but it was worried. Now, it was bothersome. And it, it results. Oh, it's miserable. It's terrible. It's awful. I know we should ask. No, no, I don't wish this on anybody, but it, no. but it's not like something we've never seen before. That's the point. Correct. And then number That's two, um, I noticed something since we last talked. I don't think I've mentioned this to you. Do you notice how most of the medical directors for the public health systems in states are pediatricians? Have you noticed that? <laughs> Which makes sense. But uh, let me just say it makes sense because they're the vaccine people, right? They're the ones that are really worried about childhood illnesses and the things where epidemiology normally bears bears out, which is in childhood illnesses and vaccine therapies, but they are not educated in adult illness. And every, almost right. every pediatrician I have spoken to that has COVID, what should we call it? COVID long hauler distress, like fear of COVID long hauler, mm -hmm has said something like, I don't want those neurological problems. There's brain shrinkage. They they show their brain shrink. And I thought to myself, and when I was talking to them, I didn't really respond because right. it was so odd for me to think that your doctors are worried. Then I said, oh, they don't have any adult experience with neurology. They don't know that these old brains shrink in response to all kinds of things, and then they get better. And even if they stay shrunk and they compensate, and there's not long-term neurological effects from these things. So their their focus is as though we're talking about a child's brain, which is a very different thing than an adult's brain. And they're fearful of something that is essentially a non-issue. What's your say? Right. No, no, I agree with you. And on top of it, not only are the people at the helm of this public health response uh, commonly pediatricians, they're either pediatricians or they're non physicians at all. Look at, you know, doc, Dr. Right, right. Barbara Ferrer there in Los Angeles. She's a right. social worker. Um, no, no, no. Pediatrician, I don't think she's even a. No, I think she's a sociologist. She's a social scientist. I don't think she, yeah, sociologist. Yes. Yeah, you're right. I don't think she's a social psychopath. Social scientist. I, I, yeah, but, but she's not I a doctor. I don't think she even has Dr. that. Anthony, no. 
No. no. Wait, if, if she was a social worker, I, I would be a little, I'd be a little happier. So go ahead, <laughs> okay. Fauci. Go ahead, but, Fauci. But, so, yeah. So my, but my, my point is that the people at the helm, no, he's ID. Either, but, but he's he hasn't see, he hasn't had a stethoscope around his neck for fifty four years. The last time he mm -hmm. practiced clinical medicine, the CAT scan hadn't been invented. True story. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people who pediatricians don't treat sick people with COVID because children don't right. get sick with COVID. So why right, from the right. beginning of this have they gone over and I mean big tech and, and the government, everybody tried to shut down people like me who are actually treating COVID patients, who actually see COVID patients, who actually know the protocols, can speak with authority about what works and what doesn't. Instead, they've tried to shut us down and they defer to either, you know, a, a sociologist or a pediatrician or somebody who's been out of clinical medicine for more than half a century. Well, here's here's one thing I've noticed. So, so I'm just I'm just sort of I, I've been, this whole thing was so as people know that watch this stream was so mystifying to me and so a stunning that what happened to our profession and our peers and what they were, way they were behaving, it was all hard for me to understand. And so one thing was, I was thinking, oh, they're pediatricians. They don't, they're not adult doctors. They don't, they don't have judgment around this stuff. I, I get it. Okay. And then, oh, or they're not doctors at all. And they don't know how to make a risk reward analysis of any type. But right. then a new thing occurred to me that two phenomenon have d emerged as not just the priorities in the decision making, but the sole phenomenology of making a decision. So during COVID, it was safety uber alice, right? Safety uber alice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so safety, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that one death is too many, which is an insane thing to say if you're trying to make a risk Correct. reward analysis. Remember those Correct. days? Yeah, it was insane. Correct. So that Correct. was an insane saying. Saying that as a physician, you can't, you're not making a risk reward decision then. You're doing something where you're going to harm because whenever you don't take right. the risk and the rewards into consideration, you're going to load up on the harms. You, they're just going to accumulate. Right. And they did. And they did. We all bore mm -hmm. witness to the economic harms, the harms to school children. It just, they just goes up and up and up. And we're only just beginning to mine the seriousness of what, what that, what that essentially following the zero COVID policy of the Chinese Communist Party. That's what we did. We decided the Chinese had it right. The zero COVID was the right way to go about this. And they did it properly. And we're going to damn, we're going to do exactly what they did, which was precisely wrong, was not even a risk reward analysis, but okay, safe to Uber Alice. But, but I've noticed what has emerged lately, and I think this is what's going on with uh, Dr. Ferrer. It's gone from safe to Uber Alice to equity Uber Alice. So equity becomes the only the only frame for making. Now, I'm not saying that safety isn't important, and I'm not saying equity isn't important. They are important. They should factor into your decision making. They shouldn't be the sole way you evaluate a, a, a decision. And it's clear to me that they just look at these one variable, and that's the prism through which they make their decisions. And man, you hurt people when you do that. What do you say? Yeah, well, what I would say, you know, I have a long career in public health, Drew, and what I would say is when I put on my public health hat, it's very, very different from when I am practicing one-on-one -on -one clinical medicine. When I'm in the emergency department or in my, you know, office and somebody comes in, they are my sole concern, that individual and what is best for that individual. Put on my public health hat and it's a whole different ball game. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population, not just an individual, which means they were obligated to consider what will the impact of the lockdown be on everybody, mask mandates, shutting down schools, limitations on capacity at bars and restaurants, and on and on. One of their gravest mistakes was acting as if everyone was an equivalent risk from this virus when we knew from the very beginning that that wasn't the case. We knew that this yeah. was a disease that primarily impacted the elderly and the otherwise infirm. Mm -hmm. We knew from the beginning that children were at such a de minimis risk from COVID as to essentially be indistinguishable from zero. Yet they applied with a broad brush. Everybody must wear a mask. 
Everybody must socially distance. Everybody must stay home and destroy their life and their livelihood. This was absolutely a debacle. And they dropped, they broke essentially every foundational construct of public health. And yeah. everybody has to panic. Yeah. And, and people seem, are still panicking. It's well, like a cold. Like, well, like I said, everybody's they like, went from, oh, you're okay. You have COVID. I hope you're okay. You're okay. I, I go, I'm fine. It's, look, I even, even when I had serious COVID, which was horrible and nasty, I had mm -hmm. a 1% fatality rate as, as a 60 year old. 1% fatality rate. I mean, I appreciate right. if people and, care and, about me. But look, me, but the 1% fatality rate, you shouldn't even be thinking about fatality. I wasn't. As a physician, I was like, 1%. Correct. I didn't even think about it. <sighs> so, not, not an issue. Right. I, just, I guess I when you don't have a well. sore throat for three years Wait. and you've like been a pristine non COVID person, like a lot of people are like, I haven't had COVID yet. And I'm like, good for you. Yeah, good for And that. you get a sore throat and it's like the end of the world. It's like, oh my God, I haven't had a sore throat in three years. Like, holy shoes. So Susan, I sent you to run to, you're reading a book that was written by one of our other guests. Uh, and you, you, I was- Snake oil. Well, and I mentioned some of the- <laughs> Michael P. Singer. I, some of the issues. It's good. Uh, Kelly, have you read it yet? There it is. Have you read it? It's, it's, it's really good. It's an, ex it's an extreme point of view. Uh, and, but in it, he, he was- it's a, it's a it's a point of view. Look, I, I'm so moderate. I, you know, I, I how like extreme can you be against China? Like, right. So give me very. a break. And so, Susan, you pulled out of there some it was some. Well, I what I found some, hang interesting. On, hang on, we were talking about how we were following the policies of the Chinese Communist right. Party. How did that happen? Yeah. So China said, you know, let's lock down, mm -hmm. and then this guy wrote in uh, a paper. He was basically a guy who um, uh, wrote books about the hidden meaning of Star Wars, and it went <laughs> it went viral. And His paper. It, and he ended up heading on over to Germany and Britain, and you know pushing this uh, this uh, problem and saying you know we need to shut down everything. And then and then Germany picked it up, and then they started something called the Panic Paper, and this is all based on speculation do the Spanish flu and it had nothing to do with medicine and the CDC never agreed to it. And you guys always talk about this, like, you know, the who just sort of picked up whatever the China was doing. And then China started their propaganda push, which was through Facebook and telling everybody, you know, you know, advertising and, the, and the pandemic response in China and what a right, good thing it was. it was. Right. And, and we then bought social it. media. Let me, yeah. Let's, let me, let's, let me interject it. Go ahead. Kelly. Let me interject here for a second, Susan, the, the, to be clear, the WHO didn't, quote, pick up what the CCP was doing. The WHO is the long arm of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, right. Tedros Ghebreyesus, you know, it, it is, it was appointed, uh, handpicked by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, to to carry out their wishes at the uh, level of the World Health Organization, they are essentially one and the same. Yeah, so that that seems and a lot to be of this true. stuff started, you know, during Mao's days. Like they used to say that there was. I I I don't want to get all political. Yeah, let's not. Let's not. But, don't go too far down but, that Yeah, hole. but but the <laughs> but it was a reaction to Trump's, you know institution they, well, it, they were pretty it, there, mad there was and, yes they and were, when it came out they just figured out a way to stop china from spreading it but then they were right because they knew what to do and th nobody had any reason behind it well, besides th just this, this is fear so back, and so panic fear and panic caused by the press a a medical establishment or a guy that wrote star wars papers. A medical establishment that was buying the propaganda of another country and in a panic themselves adopting that policy that was completely uh, ill -fated. Well, you know what's well, funny is a lot of it was tweet bots and people that went on Twitter from China and they were they were pushing the agenda through Twitter. Okay, but, and but, I was dealing with that when they were attacking hold on. you. But, but hold on. And then we ended up started getting shut down by, by um, YouTube because it was all... Chinese driven, so Susan you know, is having anti a little PTSD. Oh no, no, no! I'm, I mean, I'm reading this experience. book and I'm like, I, yep, that's exactly what happened, you know. And and I think that being, you know, of clear mind and maybe an older generation, we were just like, no, this isn't right, you know. We're yeah. not going to jump on this bandwagon. So, so there was a weird hysteria, and some people have called it, you know, you know, this delusional syndrome of some type. It was a weird hysteria that captured the country, and I understand it was a scary time, and we didn't know what was going on. But back to this issue of capturing the Chinese policy of zero COVID, 
Dr. Fauci has been on the record again lately. I, I keep hoping he'll come back to his baseline because I've been an admirer of his for 40 years. So I'm, I'm looking for him to get back to his old self. He did say something just, I saw it today, where he said, you know, I never advise schools to lock down, never. And, and I remember that. I remember saying, is the CDC telling you to do this? Did Fauci tell you? No, we just decided to do it. And you know what? It, at the time, it felt like to me was really kind of a Trump derangement syndrome. Like if Trump said, don't worry about it, then we had to run to the other side of the boat, in California particularly, and do the opposite. And, and it felt, I think, when the history books are written, it'll sort of be through that prism that, that they were doing these extreme measures that were not recommended by the CDC ever, and even the CDC itself was already in bad territory in terms of the direction it was heading. It was going again towards lockdowns, that kind of thing. But they never said no, no, no school, no schools. Go ahead, Kelly. Well, as you say, it, 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 people started parroting these things as if they were established um, constructs within public health. Things like social yeah. distancing, uh, they, they totally made up totally made up yeah. construct not a yeah. lick of scientific yeah. uh evidence or research behind it i have an entire mm -hmm. library of public health books epidemiology books virology books uh, all of them i defy anybody to pick up any one of those textbooks and find where the phrase social distancing even appears in the index made up that's right we've known for decades that masks do not stop the spread of respiratory viruses we have 200 yep. plus published studies on, on my website, uh, and then real world data proving they don't work. Yet people would parrot this. We got people out there putting your know, stickers on the floor at the Walmart, you know, stand here to be yeah. six feet apart from the person in front of you. Right. One way stickers down the grocery store aisle. This is insanity. Plexiglass shields to stop a respiratory virus. Have you lost your mind? I mean, this is stuff yeah. that even if you're, yeah. you know, even if you're not a doctor or an epidemiologist, at some point, most people took biology in ninth grade, and I would hope would start saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. You know, you watch the people walking down the street in January in New York yeah. City with those masks on, oh, and there yeah. are plumes Terrible. of condensation coming out the side and over yeah. the top. I'm thinking... Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think the air is going, people? Where <laughs> right. do you think the, the virus think it does is keep going? Your nose warm. Yeah. Oh my yeah. lord! And by the way, the, the plexiglass sure shield. In whatever you were, you know. Yeah, the the, the, uh, plexiglass the virus shield, hates. My favorite. Yeah, virus hates circulating air. So a great way to make the air not circulate, put a bunch of plexiglass shields exactly. in the room. My then, nail ladies still exactly. have that. They still have that, oh. and they don't wear masks. But all it does is screw up your nails when you hit that little <laughs> edge. Of the, it pisses me off. <laughs> well, the whole really, thing is really insane. I'm, 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 making, <laughs> well, I'm making light of it, but on the other hand, it's tragic because you take a mom and pop shop or it somebody who's trying to stay afloat, yeah. th those nail salons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they're you know, they're working on what, you know, profit margin, and they've got to now spend a bunch of money on masks and plexiglass shields and, and take out every other, you know, pedicure chair. I mean, what a crazy, crazy, unnecessary, you know, look, we left a it, look, smoldering the, crater know, where the economy was. Yeah. The, the level of incompetence was on full display. Closing yeah. beaches and playgrounds, right? Insanity. Yeah. And then we'll open them, but don't lie down and don't put a towel down. <laughs> that no sitting on the beach. That that's that is grotesque incompetence in full display. Yes. Call it what it is. Yes. Yeah. And and it's either it's one it's it's stupid or liar. And you're not you weren't they weren't lying it's about fakery. it. They were just stupid. No, it's it was fakery. It's like oh, well, we, we're telling you what to do because we know it's right. It's like right. Well, that's a different. Well, you issue. didn't study medicine. Obviously, it, it's, it's an in competence and, and then we you know you're talking about business you know how many businesses were just I, there was a business here of hamburger stands like three generations old that that now has a, a you know it's all encased essentially in in metal with a padlock on it because they dared to continue to serve hamburgers outside in violation of the public health mandate that, that this is weird That's disgusting we, I, this is not this is not. I understand it wasn't normal times, but this was. If, if one thing, if it was fully justified, it just wasn't. Well, in the, I'm the, only the, say the this scary one's part term. is in in 
It's a communist ahead, plot, Susan. okay? I'm only going to say this once. Susan is obviously having a, an extreme day, but go ahead, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> well, go ahead. Well, well, you know, in addition to the tragedy and the travesty of what happened to hundreds of millions of people because of this debacle, the, you know, the bigger mm -hmm. concern now moving forward is, you know, I've spent the last two decades in public health. What's going to happen when we sound the alarm bell about the next thing? Because there will be a yeah. next thing. There will be a next yeah, yeah. crisis at which time we need to get the attention uh, and the buy-in of the American public and the global population. And they have essentially yeah. tuned out public health. There are people who will never, ever listen to a public health mandate again because they've said these people are idiots. They're incompetent. They, you know, they have nefarious intent. They're evil, whatever it is they think, but they sure as hell aren't saying, wow, you guys did such a bangerang job. We can't wait to listen to you for, you know, guidance the next time around. Bangerang, Susan. Make I like that, that word. Yes. Hey, <laughs> are you guys, are you going to bring up the nanoparticles? Yes, today? yes, we are. We got a lot to talk about. She, yes. she and I, we get going, we can't stop I talking. I love Kelly. Yeah. I've missed you so much. So, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, <laughs> missed you Everybody, guys too. my booking first. We were we were going to give you know Kelly and I before the um the, the mics heated up we were saying let's give let's I treated tuberculosis just last weekend and we guys we'll, we were getting drug resistance even poly drug resistance tuberculosis let's get upset right. about that because that's on the rise rapidly but no that doesn't have the same ring as monkeypox does it it doesn't quite yeah. <laughs> it doesn't hit, strike the ear the same way oh my god wait yeah, a I lot said, of people I don't said know if about you, monkeypox. You Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, if you're just ahead, desperate, if you're desperate to be fearful about something, I suggest it shouldn't be COVID, as you're saying, Drew, and what I've been right. telling people, if you're just desperate to hide in the basement about something, uh, might I suggest yeah. drug-resistant tuberculosis, because that's a lot more, yeah. uh, something you have a lot more reason to fear. And monkeypox, uh, you know, the reality, Susan, is that, you know, monkeypox, we have known about since it's in humans since the mid 1980s. Yep. It's relatively rare. We have, you know, small outbreaks in sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, other third world countries, uh, not infrequently. And the reality is number one, it is not a respiratory virus. There is no reason mm -hmm. that the average individual is at any risk from it. It is spread by direct skin to skin contact. And the vast majority, mm -hmm. as in 99% of the documented cases, are amongst men who are having sex with other men. That is the reality. Yes. Um, and, it would be very and easy have, for and them we to have, shut this down. And, and we have vaccines and we have treatment for it. All the above. And it's not a Correct. fatal illness. It's a nasty illness. It's not fatal. Correct. It's yeah. primarily it kind of like a disfiguring shingles, like that one. level of nasty. You know, well, the, you like imagine the concern is places. like smallpox. Yeah, the concern is that it's disfiguring because in the same way that smallpox yeah. disfigured uh, people because of the scarring, um, you know, but monkeypox. And frankly, if it were, you know, not politically incorrect to say what I'm about to say, the reality is if they came out from a public health perspective and said anybody who is in that population should refrain from having skin to skin con intimate contact mm -hmm. for 21 days, we'd mm -hmm. essentially wipe it out. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. that's somehow deemed as being homophobic when instead it is the most solid public health advice you could give. Stop having sexual uh, contact for three weeks and we will wipe out the, the monkeypox outbreak in this country. It's really quite simple. That's an impossibility that you just well, can't expect people to be able well, to do that. It's just three weeks, not three months, <laughs> but it's three like, years. But, but here's the deal. I know. But, but well, well, we, we used to make advice you know, during HIV. People did stuff like that we, far longer, but, but yeah. that's beside the point. It, but uh, Kelly, it's back to what I was telling you. You can't say that because the only evaluative prism is equity. And if you're thinking of equity, right. you must treat the right. small as the whole. And so you can't say anything exactly. specific about subgroups. You're not allowed. And so that's that's how you hurt people. That's my point. If you only <laughs> use equity as the only means for evaluation, you exactly. will hurt people. And and you have right. to you, you have to aim for equity, you have to strive for equity, but it can't be the only criteria of your decision making and, and your messaging too, for that right. matter. So I don't mean right. to get graphic, but can I ask a question? Um, it does, does get it on the mean, penis. Yes, it does. But is it skin to skin inside or just like arm to arm? It gets up into the anus and stuff. It, uh, it can be very. If there have to be micro tips, there have to be. 
Yeah, there have to be micro tears, and that's why, and that's why uh, intercourse is is at high puts you at high risk because there can be micro tears. Um, if you just touch, you know, one finger intact skin to intact skin, you're not going to spread anything. Just like you don't spread herpes, uh, okay. frankly, that Thank way. Thank you for clarifying that because um, it know, didn't th- make sense. There has to, me. to be. Yeah. There has to be some some bro- bro- broken skin, even if it's just you know minuscule or microscopic. All right, let's take a little break here with our friends uh, from uh, Genucel. We have Dr. Kelly Victory with us here, ER doctor. I'll give you a chance when we get back. Uh, you can find, oh, is earlycovidcare.org, is that you? Earlycovidcare.org, yes. okay. yep. Okay, I'll also give you a chance to talk about, do you, you still want to talk about your organization that, that treats the uh, Fortune 500 companies? Oh no 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 no! That was that. That's a former life. That uh, I did do that for okay. many I wasn't years. Sure. Uh, but that's no okay. no. But I do think we should touch on this issue about the nanoparticle concern. Um, oh, we will. With these vaccines. We will. I, I'd like to talk about that. We absolutely. Like I said, we got a lot. To no, talk maybe about. we can take a question. We'll or take two. some calls and uh, all that when we get back. I think we have found the holy grail of skincare. Genucel has absolutely changed certainly my skincare regimen. I like that vitamin C serum, the under eye creams, skin nourishing primer. Susan loves the eyelash enhancers, uses it on her eyebrows as well. Genucel has everything to make us both feel and look amazing. Best part, the quality of the products. Using pure ingredients like antioxidants, copper peptides, and a proprietary calendula flower base, Genucel knows how to formulate products to perfection without irritation. For Susan, she hates that annoying dry area under nose during allergy season, like right here. She's tried everything, but no matter what, the skin is flaky and dry. Nothing seemed to help until she started using Genucel's Silky Smooth XV Moisturizer. Soaked right into the skin. She was hooked after one use and now loves all of their products as well. I am a snob when it comes to using products on my face. The dermatologist makes a ton of money from me. But when I was introduced to Genucel, I was so happy because... It's so affordable and it works great. I was introduced to the Ultra Retinol Cream, which I love at night. All the eye creams are amazing. People notice my skin all the time and I'm so excited because it's actually working. Right now, you can try Genucel's most popular collection of products and see what I'm talking about for yourself. Go to genucel.com and enter code DREW for 10% off. That is G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com and the code is D-R-E-W. Back. Uh, Susan, any follow on to that? I also like the hyaluronic acid underneath my skin cream. It plumps your skin up and then you put the skin cream on top and it holds all the moisture in. It was, uh, she was very busy with that. And uh, the eyelash stuff. They, they have great stuff. Yep. There you go. Uh, okay. So Dr. Kelly Victor here with us again, as I said, uh, genucel.com slash Drew is where you can get the genucel. Please do that. So we support the people that support us here. And, uh, before the break, we were be we were hinting at talking about nanoparticles, and and I assume so. Nanoparticles is a whole field of really chemical engineering, right? Which are these small, Correct. you know, nano nano uh, sized, really um, nanometer sized particles that can do lots of interesting things. Uh, I've read about it. It's uh, something that did I did not study in my training. So my, my first sort of position is I don't really in a position to talk about this stuff, except to say that my understanding is that when you talk about nanoparticles and biological systems, you're you're really talking about exosomes. Is, is that correct? Well, um, no, really what it is, is uh, it's an entire um, technology, Drew, that essentially uses yeah. small particles to deliver something yeah. to where you want it to go. There are nano emulsions, right. meaning liquids. There are na- little nanoparticles, which are used in these vaccines. It's a way of taking uh, a, a compound uh, or something to encapsulate something that you want to deliver right. elsewhere. So you want to get it so right. you could swallow it. You might inject, you know, inject it intravenously or you might inject it into the muscle. But it takes the the um, generally the electrophysiologic electrophysi- components of it, meaning is it attracted to fat or to water, you know, yeah. to help to right. facilitate the ability for you to deliver something to a very targeted area. So whether you're trying yes, to get but, a chemotherapy but, but, agent right to the you know right spot or whatever. Yes. Yes, but 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 there is there are inorganic 
nanoparticles, which are sort of, you know, they're they're okay. They're, enough, they're yes. building blocks of c crystals and things. And and when Correct. you're talking biological systems, usually you're talking about budding of bilipid membranes, which cells do of, of their own accord. Their exosomes are things that that cells. It's sort of how ribosomes work and endoplasmic reticulums and things. They're forming these budding little things that that are gold and not the Golgi. I guess it'd be the endoplasmic reticulum uh, that that these bud these little things off with proteins in it, and it goes off into the cell or it goes outside the cell if it if it you know binds with the uh, lipid bilayer. So it's in biological systems. These exosomes they they already exist, but your concern is these right. these manufactured exosomes. Yes, the, the yes, and so these lipid nanoparticles. Whether you know, it take the everybody knows. I hope by now that the current vaccines for COVID uh, use mRNA. Well, the syringe isn't just full of mRNA to, to to get it into your arm, into the deltoid muscle, and subsequently where they want it to go. It had to be put in some kind of a carrier. So what they used was a lipid nanoparticle, kind of a small, tiny, tiny little fat globule, if you will. They put the mRNA in a little fat globule, millions of them, and then that's what's in the syringe. So they inject these nano lipid, these lipid nanoparticles that are carrying the mRNA. So turns out I have huge concerns, and we could talk about those again, about the mRNA component of the vaccines. That by itself is problematic. The fact that you are induced to create these spike proteins is problematic. Mm -hmm. This is another problem. The nanoparticles themselves, the little fat globules themselves, turns out there's significant concern about the toxicity of those. And this isn't new, Drew. The study I sent to you mm -hmm. was published in 2018, but concern from scientists and physicians about potential toxicity to, uh, to uh, the uh, reproductive system amongst other places, from nanoparticles dates back to over a decade ago. I found uh, studies back to 2010, 2011, and the concerns are multiple. So when you then add this concern about potential toxicity to the reproductive system, and I could talk about the where and the why of that, and you add that to the real life data that we are seeing, which is quite a precipitous drop in birth rates around the world, Germany, you know, 10%, UK, 10%, you know, 8% in, uh, in Sweden, 23% reduction in the birth rate in 2021 in Taiwan. Uh, all around the globe, we are seeing a drop in birth rates. Interestingly, the CDC says it's, quote, because of the pandemic. Well, what about the pandemic would cause a drop in birth rates? Last I checked, you lock people indoors and don't let them leave. Um, they're more likely to have more sex, not less. So the idea that birth rates have dropped in a concerning way around the globe at the same time as we have launched these vaccines that include as a core component, lipid nanoparticles does cause me some concern. And again, I, I can't say with certainty that that's the, uh, the cause of it, but it's one of those things that should make scientists, it's what you and I do, we look at trends, we look at things that are anomalous, and we're supposed to say, wow, that's strange. What's going on? There, there is a lot of weird data out there, right? There's a lot of weird excess deaths in places you don't expect to see it. And yes. it, it, it's hard to really, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'm worrying about. Uh, Alex Berenson has his own little mm -hmm. way of analyzing all that, and I, I worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell us what the theory was about the exosome's effect on the reproductive system? Sure. Well, we've known, let's go back to, we know from a uh, study that was released from Japan um, prior to the vaccines actually being launched in this country back at the beginning of uh, 2020, we know based on the Pfizer vaccine, we were told that the Pfizer vaccine would stay in your deltoid muscle. That's the first thing we were told. It stays in your deltoid and mRNA is eliminated from the body very, very quickly, still on the CDC's website, they say within several days. So stays in your arm, goes away within several days. Turns out they knew from the Japanese study on the Pfizer vaccine, it doesn't stay in your arm. Within a matter of hours, the mRNA made it to almost every major organ system, the brain, the lungs, the heart, spleen, kidney, colon, and alarmingly, 
11% of it ended up in the reproductive organs, specifically the testes and the ovaries. So we knew early on that this vaccine was ending up in the testes and the ovaries. Then it turned out we now know from a number of studies that it doesn't break down in several days. They have documented that the mRNA remains more than 30 days in most individuals and potentially up to six months in some people. So it isn't broken down very quickly. Then we started seeing the data about impacts, for example, on sperm and sperm count, sperm quality, decreased in vaccinated individuals. We're seeing interruption of the development of eggs. We're seeing a decrease in the number of develop, developing of the follicles that are supposed to develop in order to allow you to get pregnant. We know that the nanoparticles, those little fat globules, we now know they cross the blood testicular barrier. They cross the blood placental barrier. In other words, there, there's a barrier in place between the blood and many of the organs, including the testes, the placenta, the brain, that prevents lots of toxic particles from crossing it. These nanoparticles are able to cross it. So they are able to get in. And the uh, researchers in that study that I gave you from 2018, interestingly, came out of China. They acknowledge that they it is unclear what exactly is causing the cell damage. Is it a result of inflammation? Is it a result of uh, an autoimmune issue? Is it oxidative stress? They can't say with certainty. All they can say is that a number of different cell types within the reproductive system are being significantly damaged by these nanoparticles. So, so there's that concern, and again, as with you know, we, we've talked before that these vaccines are not without concerns, and maybe sure. people of childbearing age shouldn't have it. Well, that's one thing to that is again part of the risk mm -hmm. reward analysis. I, I think if I knew that, I probably wouldn't have had it. Well, now I'd to, rather get COVID. Now, to be fair, eh, in the in the early hours, Delta, the, yeah, say the first year of this thing, Alpha and Delta, we were in a bit more of a wartime posture, right? I mean, the risk we were all willing to take to prevent the illness was higher than than say now, right? Um, and now, but I would say, but I would submit to you, Drew, that we. I would submit to you that that was the case because people were misled about their actual level of risk. Th if you had told be. young, healthy women of childbearing age, your risk from COVID is, you know, 0.001% of having a bad outcome. But instead, people were led to believe that they were at higher risk. And that is why they were in that, you know, that mindset of, oh, shoot, I, I better, I think I better that's roll a, that, the dice and get it. I think I think it's a valid point. And, and I would only push back on that by saying, Yes, but we were all in a hurry to get out of this thing. <laughs> we were being held down with a with a knee on our throat, and you know, we're, you know so and then we have to help out each other. We wanted to get and right, and that we were responsible for each other, and also miss that was not accurate necessarily. But okay, and, and so there there were issues all the way along, and you brought up earlier it might have accelerated some of the uh, some of the uh, mutations and all, which again that's that's a viable uh, sort of position. But but now it's different. Now we have a different variant. It's a different issue. It's it's a you know the risk reward is a lot different. Uh, like I, we discussed earlier, the seventy five year old plus, it's a little clearer what we're doing. We're not so worried about the so called long term effects. We're certainly not worried about reproductive organs, right? I mean, we're not seeing the kind of myocarditis problems that we're seeing in the younger population. We just we kind of more, know more what we're doing with the the eighth and ninth decades of life as it comes to this illness. And we use Paxlovid because that's where it's been studied and it works. So we have lots of good stuff for the people that are actually harmed by this illness. The ones that are actually harmed by it are the old people. Okay, so so the question then becomes, so what do we do with everybody else? So my, my first question is, what about Novavax and Covaxin? Do you have more comfort with either or both of those since they are completely different kinds of platforms? It's still spike protein, there's still some myocarditis with Novavax. What, do you, what are your thoughts on those two? Yeah, well, I, Novavax is the one I know the most about. Um, I certainly had early on much more confidence in Novavax primarily because it does not utilize mRNA. Um, mRNA is problematic by itself. There's never been a safe and effective mRNA vaccine. And as I just said, while we were told uh, that it, number one, would stay where it was put, and number two, it would get 
eliminated from the body uh, very quickly. And number three, we were told that it could not or would not incorporate into the DNA. All of those things are false. I didn't mention the last one. We now know from the big study out of Sweden that it actually does incorporate into DNA, specifically in the liver, and it does so within six hours of getting the shot. So lots of problems with, with mRNA. Novavax doesn't use mRNA. It uses another virus to actually carry uh, some of the spike yeah. proteins into your body, hoping that you right. will produce then antibodies to them. The reality is this though, it still uses the spike proteins, Drew, from the yes, original that's Wuhan right. strain. So if you get a Novavax no, that's vaccine right. today, that's right. You will create antibodies yeah. to a spike protein that doesn't exist. You will develop a useless yeah. army. But welcome to bureaucratic practice of medicine. So, <laughs> so for us to travel to Europe, I may have to get a booster, even though I've had COVID twice and a vaccine, which I reacted terribly to. Oh. Um, yeah, and if I, I do have to get a vaccine, gonna I'm going to want to get the Novavax if they'll allow me to use that as a as a um, as a booster. Well, it's less. It's, that it's to certainly me seems safer. It will be. It's safer That's what for it absolu I, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, it, 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 it isn't to going me. to protect you any better, but it won't harm you. Uh, and, and at this point, you know, it's, it's somewhat scary, but that's the that's sort of the calculation we're making. Uh, it isn't going to protect you, but at least it hopefully won't hurt you. So so let me I want to go with the last thing you said about the DNA being altered from the mRNA vaccines. We don't have a reverse transcriptase in human cells. And for for mRNA to move in and out of a nucleus, it needs a tail on it as a, a specific transport yes. tail. How does it get in the nucleus? Well, and I and I said and I've said I'm sure, quite sure on this very show, and I think you and I opined on it. You know, now probably well over a year ago, Drew. When people asked about that, I said, no, of all the concerns you have, you don't need to worry about that because that's not how it works. mRNA doesn't get incorporated into DNA. I said that because that's the way it's always been. This study out of Sweden drew very concerning. This mRNA reverse transcribed into the DNA in hepatic cells. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Again, uh, this is, you know, this is a lab, the, the virus was clearly lab created, uh, and whatever they did to this mRNA allows it to reverse transcribe. This isn't my conjecture. This is a huge study out of Sweden, very alarming, and it did it within six hours. So what mm. I, you know, I was one of the people, as I said, I came out and said, well, you know, that's tinfoil hat stuff, can't happen. That's, you know, you don't understand medicine. Yeah until it happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I can't say yeah. why it's happening, what they did to it, but I can say that the Swedish study proved that it reverse transcribed okay. into the DNA of liver cells. All right, I, I, that seems weird to me, but okay. Um, me too. <laughs> and so if, I, I just don't, I can't get it, but okay. Uh, I'm not gonna argue because I haven't really read it. But the, the, the so we're, it brings us to the issue of what to do if you're, a young person, right? Uh, if I right. had teenage kids, or if you wanted to have a baby, well, first of all, if that's I that's a young kids, kid to me. I like, don't think I would get them vaccinated. If I had children, I definitely wouldn't get them vaccinated. Well, our kids got vaccinated. It, no, no, I mean teenage, teenage oh. or young children, child age. Yeah. You know, pre, well, Paulina was in Brooklyn. She had to get vaccinated. They're, they're she couldn't go outside. They're, they're adults. They're in a different category. But they which, were twenty nine. That's child age, child bearing age. Well, now this brings up. You've already raised that issue, Kelly. What about somebody in 30 to 40 age group? Uh, should they be driven by personal preference? Should we be recommending it? How should, what should our position be on vaccine therapies with Omicron? Well, obviously people need to make a decision based on that risk benefit calculation. What is your individual risk of a severe outcome mm -hmm. from COVID and weigh that against your potential risks and the potential benefits from the vaccine. At this point, we know the vaccine will not prevent you from getting COVID and it won't prevent you from spreading it. The best they could right. say that it might do is prevent you from getting serious illness. The reality is right. the current variants don't cause serious illness. So the calculus on my, you know, from my end, uh, falls clearly in favor of not getting vaccinated. Um, there are a lot okay. of things that you, people should be vaccinated. Yeah, I get that. I get you know, that. I, I, I recommend that. vaccines what, all I the time. I disagree. Yeah. I, I'm, 
I, I'm still, I still lean a little more towards Vax because I guess I've seen so much nasty COVID. Even with the Omicron? Um, even with the, not with the BA5, I have to admit. I mean, for older people, obviously. Not, right? and, and, and by the way, I, I treat mostly elderly patients. And so I'm sort of comfortable with the boosting because I've right. seen them do well they with it. They come out okay. But, but, I, but I'm ambivalent, obviously. And, and so, um, and this is, again, this is the ball game, right? This is why you see more than one. That's why people should get consultations and talk to different doctors and listen to different doctors' opinions. We don't all have the exact same view. I on had the world. COVID twice this year, not getting the booster. All right. But what if, what if we're going to. How many? Here's, here's, here's a question a rule, for. Here's a, if it's a rule and I have to do it, I'll do it. I don't think you should get either. Here's a question to both of you, just, and this is just sort of, uh, for, you know, for my own interest. Yeah. How many people do you know who aren't? vaccinated who got COVID more than once? Less than the people who did. That's her point. I do. I mean, it's true. Correct. Correct. People yeah. like me yeah. who are unvaccinated, yeah. who got COVID. I travel on an airplane every week. I'm not saying I couldn't get BA4 or BA5. I'm not invincible. Eventually the, the virus will mutate to a form that my antibodies and my T cells and my B cells don't recognize. And I'll get it just like I can get a cold next year, you know, even though I had one last year, it can happen. But the reality is it is the vaccinated and the highly vaccinated who are getting this thing over and over and over again because the vaccine induced immunity it doesn't hold a candle to natural immunity and unfortunately people who are vaccinated who go on like you susan or you Drew, to get that don't yeah. mount the same level of immune response it's the, the data are yeah. irrefutable yeah, but yeah. if it was if it was Delta, you could die from it. Like clearly, it's probably a better idea. But um, also, if you know, once you've had it a couple times, it just gets less and less, right? You don't get as sick. It's just a cold. Well, the virus right. the virus is mutating to, to a point that's just less right. and less. That's what I'm saying. You know, Susan, as it right. mutates, it you know, we are fortunate that this virus, despite the fact that it was lab manipulated, it didn't occur in nature. We are fortunate that it is behaving like a naturally occurring virus in that it's doing those two things. It's becoming more contagious, but less lethal as it as it mutates. And that's a fortunate thing. And do not give us a YouTube ding. We're just speculating. Maybe it came from a wet market. I don't know, but we don't know where it came from. But <laughs> there certainly are features that make it look like a manipulated oh, go virus. Ahead and so. Ding us it. Who cares? Uh, YouTube so. sucks. I care. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> okay um, no it's just i mean i'm not afraid of it because i'm sort of in an age group where i i had the vaccine i've had COVID a couple times my daughter's got it right now she doesn't feel well but i think she's going to come out of it okay and you know but living through it and i mean i've had so many viruses since the kids were little like i think i was sick every month for 18 years of my their their lives and Honestly, I think my immune system needs to catch up. I need to get a cold. I need to get COVID. I need. I don't want to be hiding away from the bugs, you know, because they're still going to be out there. Right. Right. This is the right, uh, and you shouldn't. And I really, about... this is, and yeah, and I think what we really need to happen is we need folks to get back to the good old basics of focusing on all of the things that enhance your immune system's function. Everything from adequate sleep, regular exercise, stress mitigation, uh, you know, those sorts of things, uh, taking vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, the things that we know, inexpensive, easy to take, and profoundly decrease your risk of having a severe infection from COVID, as well as influenza, the common cold, and a host of other uh, viruses that are out there all the time. That's what I would really like to see people start focusing on. Get out, you know, dump the fear, dump the mask, forget this ridiculous concepts of, you know, social distancing, get back on a plane um, and get back out there because we have early treatment. Uh, if you do get COVID, there are lots of ways that we can decrease uh, significant side effects should you become uh, more, you know, ill with more than just common cold type symptoms.
we've learned a lot. Yeah. I mean, if people want to wear a mask and they don't want to go out and they want to get the vaccine, do it. If that's your preference, do it. You know, yeah, Dr. Sure. Kelly is not necessarily telling everybody to do exactly what she says. Oh. She's just giving her advice no. from what she's seen. Now, I have one more thing I want to bring up All because right. this is like the reason I have kind of a weird feeling about booster shots. Okay, okay. we had two we have two comedian friends um, who had the vaccine and about a week later, fell down and both hit their heads and had a, one went to the ER and the other one passed away. And we, they just literally just fell down and fainted, hit the back of their head without. So, so this is, a, this is what I've been worrying about with the, the, the vaccines of the particular, particularly of the really under 35, but under, under 50 to some extent, which is the myocarditis and the POTS which I think has been poorly characterized and poorly documented as of yet. And are these two folks had POTS where they had complete and total lost their blood pressure all of a sudden and fractured their skull and the occiput, both in the exact same place. Because when you when you lose your blood pressure, you just kind of go back. You, you collapse in the back, you know, your head flips back. One was on stage, the other one was alone in a hotel room. And yeah. guess which one passed and, away. But, but there's another piece to it. But people are saying, I haven't seen this documented, but there's, there's some suggestion that that it's the spike protein itself and therefore COVID itself can do this as well as the vaccine. What do we do with all that stuff, Kelly? Well, I would say, first of all, if you, um, these are unfortunate and we are seeing them by the throngs. If you Google died suddenly, uh, died suddenly has become one of the most common lines in an obituary or a death notice. Uh, the idea that they have come up with this brand new, totally made up, um, uh, diagnosis of SADS, sudden adult death syndrome, uh, in their defense, I suppose, you know, died unexpectedly from complications of a tragic, uh, you know, untested vaccine is a little unwieldy. So SADS rolls off the tip of your tongue better. But the reality is we have people who are dropping. In all likelihood, I have to say, Drew, this is POTS for people who are listening, is, is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which means when you stand up, generally it happens when you go from sitting to standing that all of a sudden your heart rate becomes very, very fast. Your heart doesn't beat um, at, at the normal rate and therefore you lose your blood pressure. Um, these people who you're talking about most likely had a cardiac dysrhythmia their heart started beating erratically. We're seeing it all the time. It's why we are seeing mm -hmm. young, healthy athletes died at 22 times the average rate last year in 2021. You have all kinds of people who are you know, uh, collapsing while, while running. Uh, the NFL has had, what, four people under the age of 35 drop dead while exercising in the past couple of months. Um, this isn't normal. Uh, we have tennis players dropping out of, uh, you know, major tournaments because they're dropping dead or, ha or, excuse me, collapsing or having chest pain. We're seeing people pass out in swimming pools. This is happening from cardiac dysrhythmia, uh, abnormal yeah. heart rhythms that therefore cause you to not pump adequate amount of blood to your brain. You don't get blood to your brain. You don't get oxygen to your brain and you pass out unless you are with yeah. people who can intervene quickly, you're gonna end up at the bottom of a swimming pool and you're gonna be dead. And then what happens is happening all the time. They do autopsies and they're saying, quote, you know, natural causes. Well, let's just look at somebody like yeah. Justin Bieber. Maybe Justin Bieber's Ramsey Hunt syndrome was just bad luck. And his 26 year old wife's brain hemorrhage, just bad luck. That's some pretty bad luck in people who are too young and too well, healthy to be having to be these fair, things. Her, hers was even, you, you're going to like what she she actually had a paradoxical embolus. She had a DVT and a patent foramen ovale. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what are causing excess clotting? The vaccines are associated right. with excess clotting. Right. Yeah, so, Correct. And, that's, um, and so what I'm saying is that, you know, I, again, we are seeing and we know again um, from the data that's being reported by the life insurance companies, there's been a 40 percent increase in all cause mortality in 18 to 49 year olds 40 percent if you know anything about statistics that's a four sigma increase absolutely yeah. unheard Listen, of in my, what's in my career that? i've only seen i don't know i've only seen one in my career and now i certainly feel like i'm seeing a lot of more of that kind of stuff and and i and i don't yeah. know what to do with it and i don't understand why well it, it just just the way we approached the idea that the vaccine caused myocarditis, I thought was very odd. 
throughout my career, I don't know how you handle myocarditis in an emergency room, but myocarditis is a medical emergency. You go right, right to the into the right. hospital. It's because of exactly right. this. You can get rhythm disturbances and heart failure. I mean, it is a right. it is a rare and serious thing. It's like, oh, well, only one per 3,000 myocarditis, and most of it was mild. Yeah, I'm glad. It's still a very, very serious condition. And I, you know, I, I don't understand you recover, why there's not you more. Recover, yeah, yeah, even if you get Go out ahead. of the hospital, Drew, you have exponentially yeah. increased your risk of heart failure down the road. There Later. are people who get yep. over, yep. quote unquote, their myocarditis and then are on the heart transplant list 20 years later. Um, so, and again, right. I cannot say with certainty that any one individual case is the result of the vaccine, mm -hmm. but it is the job of epidemiologists, the job of scientists and physicians to look at patterns and say, I can't speak about that one or even those three, but we have dozens, hundreds, thousands of them stacking up. And it is the job of the CDC. That's their job to look at these anomalies and, and delve into yeah. the data. Instead, I will get kicked, you know, I'm kicked off Twitter because I dared to raise the question. You know, they will take, you know, 50% of your YouTubes with me down because we discuss this. What I'm suggesting is that we actually follow the science. Let's act like scientists are supposed to act, which is have open, rigorous, right. vigorous debate about these things and come up with, if yeah. it's not the vaccines, great, I'm open. What do you think it is? Maybe people are just what is it? Yeah. Know, stressed out by climate. Yeah. Maybe it's climate change. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's right. Exactly. Like, like, let's figure this out. But I don't understand why it's not being dealt with with sense of urgency right. I, it, to me it's like I, that you, what they're saying is oh this really it. isn't real it's like i i maybe we are over reporting it but then publish something that tells me that that's the case and i and i don't think that's what they're finding i think it is a, well because they're afraid of getting shut down by something i i don't know what they're I, they they seem to be afraid of the truth always i mean well, obviously health is well, not a one size fits all so what, Here, what here's think? what i think i think the reality is this they know darn well, it's the vaccines mm. and their mm. ramifications, the repercussions of that are so profound to come out and say now, whoops, after people have lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods, got kicked out of the military, uh, weren't able to finish their educations, you know, had, were forced, mandated in many cases to get these injections, to come back now and say, yeah. turns out, we actually hadn't tested them. We never tested them on pregnant women or women of childbearing age. We never tested them on people with autoimmune diseases. We never tested them on people who are on X, Y, and Z class of drugs. We just gave them, a, again, broad brush, told everybody to get one, not only get one, get two, get three, whatever it is. I think the, the fallout, Drew, would be so profound um, that I'm just not yeah. sure they can get their arms around it. Yeah, but wouldn't you think there would be somebody that would do that research and really look at these things? Well, I guess you're maybe looking there's no back funding in for time, it. You know, I, you I guys know. as clinicians are looking back and going, yeah, we could have done this a little differently. Oh, But we didn't know. I mean, history's not going to be kind. In 10 oh, years, no, we're going to see more stuff. That's Both of us were asking for a different approach a year and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, we, you we guys were. were but it, we I, but, but uh, now you the can look swine, back the swine and see the defects. Swine, you know, the flu? swine flu vaccine, the swine flu vaccine that came out in 1976 uh, was going to get rolled out in a mass again, again, a mass vaccination initiative was pulled from the market when there were 25 associated deaths, 25 yeah. got pulled off the market. We have tens of thousands of deaths that have been attributed to this, that have been reported to VAERS. And everybody should know that VAERS, uh, you know, wildly underestimates the actual number of adverse events. So again, I'm suggesting that although it might have made sense early on to say, look, this thing hasn't been adequately tested, but we're talking about giving it only to a small group of people, people in nursing homes say, you know, people in nursing homes don't need to worry about fertility issues. We don't need to, you know, right, frankly, right. we don't want them to get myocarditis, but- And know, they don't get, they don't get myocarditis, they don't get it. Right, they don't you know, they, they're such high risk from this virus that we're gonna roll yeah. the dice and we know it hasn't yeah. been tested yeah, yeah. and we're gonna give it to those people. I could have lived with that, 
But the idea that you're going to yeah. take young military recruits who have not a risk in hell of getting significantly ill from COVID, and you're going to force them to take these vaccines that, that can have lifelong mm. effects. I mean, it's, it's unconscionable. I'm trying to get some calls going here. Let me, uh, we're not going to have much time for them, but this is a Trey. Give you a chance to go a little speak long up if here. You want. Yeah, yeah. Trey, you're muted there. Your mic's in the lower left hand corner. If you just unmute that, there you are. Hey, hey, hey Drew. Hey there. How you doing? Good. Hey, uh, I got I got a couple quick questions. One, um, have you seen any epiglottitis coming out of uh, any of this COVID virus? I have not seen epiglottitis, but it doesn't surprise me there might be. What do you say, Kelly? If you're diabetic, I imagine the risk would be higher. What, Kelly, what do you say? It's a great question. I, I haven't seen epiglottitis, but what I can tell you, we've seen a huge increase in what I call the itises, uh, myocarditis, pericarditis, hepatitis, neuritis, uh, itises, mm. itis being simply in medicine, meaning inflammation. So we're seeing gobs of things related to increased inflammation in the body. So epiglottitis would be inflammation of the epiglottis. Uh, and although I have not seen that, it's not a stretch for me to imagine that that could be related to the vaccine because and, and, of this inflammatory uh, process. And, and, and Trey, we think about epiglottitis, you know, as something it's children and diabetics. Are you diabetic? No, sir. Um, okay. Real, real quick. So in June, June 15th, I suffered uh, epiglottitis and I went to urgent care for a sore throat. Next thing you know, they're hitting me with an EpiPen and then I'm at the hospital getting an emergency tracheotomy. Ugh. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, that was pleasant. Let me tell you, Drew. <laughs> um, so after the tracheotomy, they put me on a ventilator and I got a subcutaneous emphysema. Is that something that happens often with that? Well, subcutaneous emphysema is either because they didn't put the trach tube in the right place, or you had a you blew a bleb or something. You know, you blew out a part yeah. of the lung. Ke Kelly, any other ideas? Yeah, they, they yeah, well, either you either got a, a small rent in uh, in one of your airways that allowed air to get where yeah. it isn't supposed to be. No, that isn't normal. Yeah. Um, and, no, it's not normal. Uh, and epiglottitis, at all. you know, ep epiglottitis is a, is an emergency uh, because you can close off yeah. your airway. It, it can yeah. swell your airway yeah. such that yeah, you was, can't breathe. It's generally infectious. Um, so I can't say yeah. with any certainty whether it could be related to the vaccines. Generally, an infectious process. Okay. Yeah. No. There. There's no. They couldn't culture anything, and I'm not allergic to anything. Weird. Uh, it, Weird. Fourteen days yeah. in the ICU after the procedure, and, and now I'm in a uh, outpatient uh, in-home OT and PT because after my, my right eye almost came out of the socket, it was coming out. Um, and I was having, you know, really rapid heart beating from the air, and I ended up pulling everything out of myself uh, because the doctors wouldn't listen to me that it was crushing my brain and my heart. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was just, I was curious about that, um, and you know, just wondering if epiglottitis, if you guys have you've seen a lot of that lately. No, we have not, but man, no. you, dude, I'm so sorry. It sounds like one misadventure after another. And let's be clear, subcutaneous emphysema happens, but it's a complication of the intubation. Yeah. It's not something you expect from the intubation. Woo, that is rough, man. Woo. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, talk to Stephen. Stephen. Uh, again, you got all you guys got to uh, unmute your mics as you can. There you are, Stephen. What's up? Oop, you're now you are muted again. You were you were unmuted a second. There you are. Okay, good. Uh, is there any increase in heart attacks in uh, I'd say males over fifty from the MRA vaccine? Go well, ahead. there's there's no yeah, there's no question. You know, one of the things that I posted early on, the thing that got me ultimately banned uh, permanently from Twitter was I posted the sworn testimony from three military physicians who testified in front of Congress specifically about the increase in the incidence of certain things that they were seeing uh, in calendar year 2021. Uh, and one of the things that they reported was a nearly 400 percent 
increase in heart attacks, myocardial infarctions um, compared mm. to other years. These physicians actually took the time. They went back and calculated the five-year average, Drew, from 2016 through 2020 of a number of different things, pulmonary embolisms, you know, Bell's palsy, heart attacks, uh, strokes, blood clots to the lung, you know, infertility, lots of things because they want, it was their sense that they were seeing an increase in these things in 2021, but they wanted to actually compare them to statistical you know, historic numbers. And as I said, they saw a nearly 400% increase in heart attacks, a uh, huge increase, 367% increase in, in blood clots to the lung, massive increase, almost 400% increase in Bell's palsy and on and on. So there's no question uh, that we are seeing increases in, in these the incidence of these particular things and heart attacks, myocarditis and pericarditis are amongst them. Uh, someone named Sapphire on my stream here was telling me, according to the study you were talking about the, with the liver cells, it is the L1 retro transport, L1 retro transposon machinery in human cells that are able to retro transcribe RNA to DNA. So there it is that we do have a enzyme that will do it. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I worry about blaming the vaccines for endo my endovascular anything, because I think there's something about this spike protein, whether it is, whether it's from the infection or from the, from the vaccines that is doing some endovascular damage of some type. But what do you say? Right. Right. Well, but Drew, okay. So if you get COVID, you have the spike protein in your body for a matter of days before your immune system wipes it out. You get a vaccine, your body is given the roadmap, start creating these spike proteins. You're, you're right, the spike protein is what's doing it, but you have just injected in you a roadmap that says, start creating this toxic thing that's gonna attack all of your organ systems and it's gonna attach itself to the endothelium of your vasculature. So yeah, and there's no off switch. You know, we were told, as I said, it will be eliminated from your body within several days when it turns out it can stay for months. So yeah, you now have mRNA saying, produce a spike protein, produce a spike protein, produce a spike protein. That, so it is the vaccines because you are creating the toxic component, the spike protein, in addition to anything having to do with nanoparticles. Unmute your mic there, Hokey. There you are. <laughs> hey, Dr. Drew, you're my homie now. I'm yeah. like eczema. You can't get rid of me. Well, welcome back. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to say, Dr. Kelly, you, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I love to hear it. I, I feel like, okay, so I, I'm a fourth year uh, DDS student. And, you know, even though it's a thankless job with no respect, no one likes, you know, but it's necessary. Okay. <laughs> but what people don't realize is that, you know, we have to know is just as much as you guys do. And trust yeah. me, sometimes I'm like, I don't care about the freaking kidney, you know, glottomus and <laughs> right. But we do have to have the understanding as far as, you know, medications and all of that for our patients and, and the, you know, conditions and all of that. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. We also have to have a very second skill, which is, you know, hand skills, right? So it's like double the, it's like a double whammy of crap. And that's why we have the highest suicide rates and whatever else, you know, it's, 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 it's tough, but I am fascinated by everything you said, Dr. Kelly. Uh, it's, it, it's, we need to hear this. I feel like I, okay. So I am you know, in my early thirties, if anyone asks, it's my fifth, third, uh, 29th birthday. Um, <laughs> but we don't hear much like Dr. Drew said about the age group of 30 to 40. Right. And, um, I have to say that like I, um, was one that, uh, didn't get the vaccine and, um, knock on wood, thank God, like I'm doing the sign of the cross. I have to say that I, I have not gotten and, and sick. And they let you they let you stay in dental school without the vaccine? Well, well no, exactly. And, that, and that's another, that's a whole other thing. I mean, we were obligated, but there was, uh, maybe it's the, maybe it's the Axl Rose in me or something, you know, that I was just like, no, because, and, and we agree, like, the, and there was a couple other girls in my class that we were just like, first of all, everything that Dr. V uh, said. You know what? Uh, I mean, hey, we you don't know, know enough. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I forgot your name again. Are you, tell us the name again. Liz. It's Liz. 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 You can call me Mrs. Mrs. Rose. Okay, Mrs. Rose. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm kidding. So, I'm kidding. But, but Liz, I wish. Liz, the the what I'm really interested from you is here are mm -hmm. two peers just having a conversation about the the medical 
issues of our time, which are very serious and had massive social impact and massive developmental impact on children. All these things have had massive Absolutely. impact. And we are very, very, very concerned about what our peers have been doing and what the medical system right. is doing and the public health. Right. You're a young person. Yes. What, what we have been largely silenced in our ability to sort of have these conversations. And I, yes, yes. I, I talked to, exactly. I talked to, P, I, the, do you know who David Gorski is or Goreski, uh, Kelly, David, he's a, he's a, he a nobody. Attacked, he, no, he's not. He was a breast cancer <laughs> guy. He was, he was attacked by the, you're breast... not talking about the Gorski on Twitter. Yes, you're yes. getting him mixed up. Yeah, I am talking about him. He's not a breast. Yes, he is. And he, and he, got attacked by the anti-vax world, so he's become very defensive. And he attacked me for daring to interview Pierre Corey. And, and I was like, we had an interesting conversation about the function of academic medicine and how off base it had been during the, there was, we weren't talking about vaccines right. or ivermectin or anything else. We were just talking about mm -hmm. how our system, how our peers were functioning, how bizarre it was. But I wanna ask Liz, it's a good thing, right? The young people well, feel that it's a good thing to people to have open conversation that have oh, uh, professional experience and, and, and opinions. And honestly, <laughs> the reason I wanted to call in is just to, I mean, you know, no one cares, you know, about my, my, my personal whatever, but you know, as a specimen, if you will, Dr. Kelly, you know, I mean, you know, I'm 33 and I did not get the vaccine and I have never had COVID knock on wood. But, but, but tell me as a young um, person though, are we on, uh, we're not going to be, we're not, we're not doing something offensive to young people by having these conversations. No, not at all. I think this is yeah. great. I what? think this is like what we all need to hear, like hearing right. Dr. Kelly tell us right. all of the stuff that we already know. I mean, think about it. I mean, at this level, you know, we are, you know, biology and majors and we've had to do all this crap. So we all understand that there's, you know, a flu vaccine is just an estimate of right. what mutated That's cell right. they just think that it could be That's that right. certain year. And so, you know, as you know, you know, we know these things, you know, more than just like a random public person, which trust me, guys, sometimes it's like you don't want to know this stuff. It's boring. It's crazy. But uh, <laughs> But we do know and we understand these things. And it's all like she was saying, the, the mutations, we can't predict. Yes. We just make our best it, guess. It, it's, biology is complicated. There are not yes, right. there are not just so truths in biology. There, there's sort of right. probabilistic truths and there's adjustment and, you know, again, discourse to try to arrive at the truth. So we're yes. we're trying to do and that. That's I, what we're trying to right, do. Right, right. And I guess I guess my my thing is that there were a few of us girls, you know, late twenties, early thirties, that were like, you know, I don't want this vaccine. First of all, we don't know anything about it, really. Uh, right. You know, we don't know enough long term studies because we haven't been able to, you know, like go on for years and find out so well we this still is don't interestingly really know. you know when we were i'm going to put you back in the audience list thank you so much when uh when i went to france the the youth there was rising up about this exact exactly what liz was describing there's a, a very significant wind blowing in the french youth around this issue they're saying look you told us we're not going to get harmed by this thing but now you're forcing us to get some vaccine that we you don't really fully right. understand yeah. The, the yeah so it's interesting it's all very interesting i i I well, certainly wouldn't want to be on know, the side of mandating a vaccine just to young people when the risks are limited. So that would be no. The, the, the reality is, the immun immunology is the last fr great frontier of human medicine. Drew, it's very complicated. I am hardly anti-vaccine, yeah. but what I am is pro safety and pro data. And the average vaccine yep, yep. takes six to eight years if it to come to market if it ever comes to market many of them have failed yep. there are a heck of a lot of viruses for which we've never created a safe and effective vaccine for things like herpes yep. coxsackie virus yep. norovirus hiv lots of them not because we have tried but be Right, because they failed. And sometimes they failed with yeah. devastating consequences during the trials. Yeah. So when anybody mm -hmm. says to me, these vaccines have been proven to be safe, I say, great, just show me the 36 month safety data. And they look at you blankly and they say, we don't have it. I say, of course you don't have it because these are brand new. We don't know the impact on fertility, autoimmune diseases, cancers, neurologic development, yeah. and on and yeah. on because they were inadequately tested. So, so even though I, I would argue that I'm probably a little more on the side of vaccine and boosting, again, biased by my experience treating elderly patients, uh, 
we would both, I'm just looking for our, our, our areas of agreement. We agree that under 20, very hard decision. Under eight, easy decision, don't do it. <laughs> right. And in your right. 20s and 30s, per personal decision, hard to make that decision. Look at Novavax, that might be a better alternative, maybe. Worried about endocarditis, worry about myocarditis, worry about POTS, and we're worried about these things, right? So we, we agree on all that stuff. Um, uh, worried about the psychological welfare oh, of our human kind. Worried about our profession and how it behaved right. and what public right. health is all about now. Will oh people God. respond to public health next time? And why did they adopt the strategy of a Chinese Communist Party? And what did Trump derangement do to their decision making? There's so many mm -hmm. things that have to be carefully analyzed. And what right. about the myocarditis? And how serious is it? And why isn't it being taken more seriously? You know, this is all stuff that. You and I could talk about it all day, it seems to me, and and I and I appreciate the chance to kind of stir it up, mix it up, look at these things, and these things I worry about. I'm still using plenty of Paxlovid and people for which it's not been studied, you know, in middle age and younger people that want help with the illness, and it's working, even though we don't have the randomized controlled trials there. Seen some rebounds. I've seen some rebounds from Paxlovid. I'm worried my daughter who took Paxlovid may be sick now with Omicron because she didn't get a a robust immune response right. because we gave her Paxlovid maybe. Maybe that's right. a possibility, right. I don't know. But these are all things that need to be discussed, need to be thought about. Yeah, what and, do you think about that? Oh, yes. Well, uh, yeah, yeah I, you know, again, uh, again, Paxlovid is a brand new drug. We don't have a good yeah. data on it. We know that there are gobs yeah. of medication um, interactions. For example, the president uh, has to be off of his blood thinner, his eloquence, and off of his mm. cholesterol medication while he's on the Paxlovid. Uh -oh. Now, while he's not going to, yeah, is he on have Coumadin some, or is know, that heparin? He, no, he's not. He's off, and that's the problem. They have taken him Jesus. off of oh, his boy. blood thinners. So here's a guy who's at huge risk for stroke because of his irregular heartbeat. Uh, they've taken him Jeez. off of that to treat him with All an experimental them? antiviral. Yes, and the, and these are concerning things to me. Why didn't so they give again, him monoclonal he, antibodies? They, the jury's out whether they have or not. They haven't said. Um, but the reality is, uh. I'm not a huge fan. Again, in people who are at relatively low risk, um, you know, why not use some of the other things that we know work very, and, very and well? Let, let me ask you: is, is, it, is the is the yeah fluvoxamine I took is the is the uh, you, is Coumadin contraindicated with Paxlovid, and what, what's the issue? Is it how it's um, I'd have to or? look. At, I'd have to look at yeah. the whole list, Drew. There anything that's uh, that's yeah, me too. Uh, metabolized through the liver. Um, I, you know, I don't prescribe Paxlovid. You can always adjust it though. There's, a no, there's an enormous um, list of medications. So you know, but the bottom line is, it, again, I would say that when asked just recently at an FDA meeting, the three drug manufacturers. Uh, have, the, excuse me, vaccine manufacturers, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, &J, were asked how quickly they could come up with this new bivalent vaccine, the one that's going to include uh, both the Wuhan strain and some of the Omicron subvariants, BA4 and BA5. And they said, quote, unquote, well, we can do it very quickly, certainly by fall, as long as we don't have to provide any safety data. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And, and this is yeah, a problem. Well, you, you know, well, yeah, and, you're and right. Then, I could I could develop a new car if I didn't have to prove any safety data. I could develop a <laughs> lot of things, Drew, and put them out to the market. If I a new but, baby car seats, uh, if I didn't have to have any safety data. But but think about it this way: the way medicine is supposed to work is we're supposed to make those risk or decisions on behalf of the patient. And uh, you know, obviously, I know which way you'd come down with that decision. And and. And and that's how it's supposed to work, as opposed to handing down mandates on from on high. Right. So I will just finish with the, the one thing that you and I categorically have extreme discomfort with is this tendency towards mandates and mandates and lockdowns yes. and masking yes. and mandates. These things do harm. Would we agree on that? 100%, Drew. 100%. Yes, yes. And, and I also can All agree right. with you that, that we need this kind of debate uh, this is the most important yeah. thing you can you know, do, and I appreciate yeah. you providing the platform for it. Yeah, it's not it's not as simple as vaccine good, vaccine bad. You know what I mean? It's it's Correct. a it's a complicated nuance. We we just spent an hour and a half going through all the different issues you know that are that are pertinent to this decision making and to the end of the situation we're mm -hmm. in. 
And, and and for the people that came in late in the conversation, Dr. Kelly mentioned at the beginning how, you know, Delta was a stronger variant and the vaccines work, but now the vaccines don't work for that variant. They right. for the Omicron variants. But well, they may have that, a, they, but it's more complicated. Drew would point. tell you that that was a stronger variant and much more lethal than the Omicron. Okay, so Susan, you just you just reframed something that we were trying to tease through, which was there may be some cellular immunity left over that might decrease the risk of more severe illness. I had seen some bad illnesses in the BA2 variants. Neither of us are seeing severe illness in the BA5, so right. maybe we don't need to be concerned about it. So that's all the different thoughts she and I have to have before we make a decision. But some on people came into the conversation maybe halfway through on yes. Rumble or, or wherever on YouTube. Yes. So yeah, listen to the beginning because she goes through every detail from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, we went, we went through the first principles and we went, she, went through everything. They covered a lot of ground before, yeah. like everybody's really going off and they're kind of confused. Yeah, if you and, didn't listen, if you didn't hear us talking from the beginning, it, it'd probably be hard to understand exactly what our position is. Yeah, there's a because, comprehensive right? beginning to end. On this yeah, thing. because we because these are complicated decisions and it should be up to the patient doctor unit to be making these decisions. Yes. Uh, not the Indeed. government and not centralized a th bureaucratic but, authority in medicine. But I mean, we want medicine. people to be well and we want them to live long lives and we want them to everybody to be happy and get back to normal and, you know, be able to not be afraid to go in an airport or like she said, and I'm not, I, but honestly, I personally, I'm not a doctor, but I don't mind getting the virus. I'd rather do that because I just really don't want to, I've seen my friends have pots or whatever you call it sad and it just it freaks me out and somebody had died very close to us and it, it breaks my heart and a lot of people in this stream have had other people who have died from covid and they are pro-vax they know that it's important and that is good but it's just it's hard because now we have to redevelop the medication for the future and not not just go by whatever you know talk to your doctor Yes. Get your doctor's opinion. This is a not one size fits all situation. No, nothing is in medicine. Yeah. Nothing is. That's what was so shocking. But Kelly's been shocking researching about this, this and whole she knows thing. so much about it. Oh, I know. And she's Listen, she, and she's been that's why we love talking to her. She's been attacked by people and she's been shut down and censored and we get kicked off YouTube every time we mention Nobody should be censored. Ivermectin. If we just mention the word, we get kicked off YouTube. <laughs> Literally. So we'll see if me mentioning it here at the end gets us kicked off. That's what happens every damn time. We had to start calling it the I word because if we'd exactly. mention it. And by the way, this might, I, I tweeted the other day, all human medication have veterinary application. Why did this one medicine we start to refer to from its veterinary application? Uh, oh my God, you're getting cat lymphoma medicine for your cancer that's for cats or oh my god you're getting uh pepsi you, my adam was telling me he's giving pepsid to his dog oh you're taking dog medicine when you take your pepsid don't you know that all medicine has veterinary application everybody please now stop it stop it ugh part of the grossness <laughs> where's the it crazy strikes back <laughs> so yeah, I right. love it when you get mad. Right. So, so turns me on, honey. Yeah, uh, good. Well, uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, but <laughs> so, so, so we're gonna wrap it up. I've been. We've gone. You know, now I'm sorry that I know there's still more questions on there. We'll be back tomorrow, I promise, and Thursday as well at three o'clock. We can take more calls then. Uh, we uh, and we will have Kelly back soon. She'll come up with the next. Um, article and keep us yes, ahead of yes and kelly's ahead always ahead of the curve always wonderful to talk so about. we have to wait like Happy a few weeks though so where do you want people get... to find you kelly to give us a last little push here where do you want people to find you well i'm on getter um at kelly victory md uh having been kicked off twitter you can find me on getter at kelly victory md and then the website i'm associated with is earlycovidcare.org i'm there with uh, a rarefied uh group of folks, Dr. Peter McCullough, uh, Pierre Corey, uh, Harvey Reich, and a group of really great people. If nothing else, you can find there a great compendium. There's a huge library of articles on everything from masks to the vaccines to treatment protocols. There are resources there to find a doctor if you're looking for a physician um, who knows the treatment protocols, either for COVID or for vaccine-related injuries. There's a lot of resources there. It is not a money-making endeavor. It is purely a resource for folks uh, looking for additional information. So earlycovidcare.org or Kelly Victory MD on Getter. 
All right. We will leave it at that. Kelly, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thanks thank for you for having me. and the Rumble Ranters. And we will see you guys tomorrow at 3 o'clock Pacific time. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Would you give me my first prostate exam on this show if, whenever I need to be 45? Uh, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'll do it. But you need a PSA too. You got to get the blood I test. I think we do have gloves somewhere if you're serious. Oh, Jesus. No, we're not doing it right now. I mean, fine, do it. Get the gloves. Fuck. It would be hilarious. We'll create a viral moment. Are you throwing if that he, gauntlet down? Are you challenging me? I'm saying I... Or well, here's my problem. What if he finds out I have prostate cancer? It's, it's, it's it would be haunting. It's very unlikely. What a horrible way to find very out. Very unlikely. He just puts his finger in. He's like, everyone's laughing. And he's like, oh, my God, wait. <laughs> <laughs>